Chapter Five of the Moors in Spain by Stanley Lane Poole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Christian Martyrs. The Sultan Hakam died in eight twenty two after a reign of twenty six years. He left a comparatively tranquil inheritance to his son Abdel Rahman the Second. The renegade of Cordoba had been subdued and exiled. The bigots had been given a lesson that they were not likely to forget, and there only remained the chronic disturbance on the Christian borders to be occasionally repressed. Abdel Rahman II inherited his father's talent for enjoyment, but not that strength of character by which self-indulgence was preserved from degenerating into weakness. The new sultan converted Cordoba into a second Baghdad and imitated the prodigalities of the great Harun al Rashid, who had recently left the scene of his fantastic amusement for, let us hope, a better world. Abderrahman built palaces, laid out gardens, and beautified his capital with mosques, mansions, and bridges. Like all cultivated Muslim sovereigns, he was a lover of poetry and claimed to be no mean poet himself, though his verses were sometimes written by other pens whom he paid to compose for him. His tastes were refined, and his nature was gentle and easily led. Four people ruled him throughout his career. One was a singer, the second a theologian, the third a woman, and the fourth a black slave. The most influential of these was the theologian Yahya, the same who had before stirred up the students against Hakam, and who now acquired an absolute ascendancy over the mind of new sultan. The queen Tarub and the slave Nasr, however, exercised no light authority in political matters, but the singer Ziyab confined his interest to matters of taste and culture, and refused to meddle in the vulgar strife of politics. He was a Persian, and had been a pupil of the famous musician of Baghdad, Isaac the Muslite, until one day he had the misfortune to excel his master in performance before the Caliph Harun, and had immediately afterwards been offered by the jealous Muslite the choice of death or banishment. He accepted the letter and, arriving in Spain, was received with effusion by the cultivated sultan, who assigned him a handsome pension, supplies of food, houses and other privileges and allowances, so that the fortunate singer counted an immense income. So delighted was the sultan with Ziyab's talents that he would sit him beside him and share his meals with him and would listen for hours to his songs and to the wonderful tales he could tell of the bygone times and the wise sayings he could relate from his boundless store of reading he knew more than a thousand songs by heart each with its separate tune which he said the spirits of the air taught him he added the fifth string to the lute and his style of playing was quite unlike anyone else's so that people who had heard him would listen to none other afterwards. He had a curious way with his musical pupils. He used to make the would-be singer sit down and try to sing his loudest. If the voice was weak, he told him to tie a band round his waist to increase the volume of sounds. If he stammered or had any defect in his speech, Zidia made him keep a piece of wood in his mouth till his jaws were properly stretched. After this, if the novice could shout ah at the top of his voice and keep the sound sustained, he took him as a pupil and trained him carefully. If not, he dismissed him. Never was anyone so polished, so witty, so entertaining as Riyab. He soon became the most popular man in Andalusia and held the position of habit of fashion like Petronius or Beau Brummel. He made the people change the manner of wearing their hair. He introduced asparagus and forced meat balls in Andalusia, and the dish was long afterwards known as Zidiab's fricassee. 
He set the example of drinking out of glass vessels instead of metal, of sleeping on leather beds, dining off leather mats, and a host of other refinements, while he insisted on careful gradation of clothes, diminishing by slow degrees from the thick of winter to the thin of summer, instead of the abrupt change which the people had hitherto made. Whatever he prescribed, the fashionable world followed. There was nothing that this delightful epicure could not persuade them to think both necessary and charming. But while the court was preoccupied with the tasting of new dishes or the cut of its hair, there were earnest people among the subjects of the sultan in Cordova itself who were observed by much deeper thought. It was not the external enemy that thus endangered the peace of the Moorish kingdom. Many a time, indeed, did Abderrahman II, who was not wanting in personal courage and love of military glory, led his armies with success against the Christians of the north, who, aided by Louis the Debonair, were continually making some expeditions or foray over the frontiers. These petty campaigns were not yet serious enough to shake the stability of the Muslim rule. The trouble in these early days always came from within. In the present instance, it arose from the too exalted spirit of a small number of Christians at Cordoba. Most of the Christians, indeed, were by no means anxious to emphasize their creed. They found themselves well treated, free to worship as they pleased, with no hindrance from their rulers, and also free to trade and get rich, as well as their Muslim neighbors. What more could be desired, unless the recovery of their ancient kingdom? And as that was impossible just then, they were content to let well alone, and make the best of their mild and tolerant governors. This temper was very general in Andalusia, but there were here and there ambitious or enthusiastic spirits that chafed against such compliance with the rule of the infidel. They remembered the former power and prosperity of their church, and the priests especially could no longer restrain their hatred of the Muslims who had taken away from them their authority and substituted the false creed for the religion of Christ. The very tolerance of the Moors only exasperated such fervent souls. They preferred to be persecuted like the saint of old. They longed to be martyrs, and they were indignant with the Muslims because they would not persecute them for rightness' sake and ensure them the kingdom of heaven. Especially hateful to these honest people were the open gaiety and sensuous refinement of the Moors, their enjoyment of life and all its pleasure, their music and singing, their very learning and science were abhorrent to these ascetics. Life, to the true believer, meant only scourges and fast, penances and confessions, purification through suffering, the mortifying of the flesh and sanctifying of the spirit. What happened was, in truth, nothing but the manifestation of the ascetic or monastic form of Christianity among the subject population. A sudden and violent enthusiasm took the place of the indifference that had hitherto been the prevailing characteristics of Spanish Christianity, and a race for martyrdom began. It was a grievous pity to see good people throwing away their lives and the lives of others for a dream. The suicides of Andalusia were really no whit more reasonable or truly religious than the sufferings of the priests of Baal, who cut themselves with knives, or of the Indian ascetics who let their nails grow through the palms of their hands. The fact that the Spanish martyrs were mad in better cause does not make them less insane. Christianity does not teach its disciples to fling away their lives wantonly out of mere joy in being tortured or killed. It was not as if the Christians were persecuted or hindered in the exercise of their faith. It was not as if the Moors were ignorant of Christianity and needed to be preached to. They knew more of the scriptures than many of the Christians themselves, 
and they never spoke the name of Jesus Christ without adding, May God bless him. Mohammedanism recognizes the inspired nature of Christ and inculcate profound reverence toward him. The Muslims were not ignorant of Christianity, but they preferred their own creed, and while they let the Christians hold to theirs, there is no excuse for latter posing in the heroic character of persecuted believers. Indeed, there is no rational way of getting martyred, since Christians who are allowed to free exercise their religious rights might preach and teach without let or hindrance, they could not find a legal ground for being persecuted unless they left the path of the gospel and set aside the great lesson of Christ. Love your enemies, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. They were not despitefully used or persecuted. The mass of the Christians were entirely unmolested, and though the priests were sometimes subjected to some public ridicule by the street boys and common people, the better class of Muslims never joined in this. Yet so far were the poor Christians from attempting to love these mild adversaries that they went out of their way to curse them and blaspheme their religion with the simple intention of being martyred for their pains. Now it is well known law in Muslim countries that he who blasphemes the prophet Muhammad or his religion must die. It is a stern and barbarous law, but the world has seen as bad principles carried into effect over the faggots of Smithfield and Oxford in later ages than that of which we are writing. Willfully to stir up religious strife and injuriously to abuse another faith are no deeds for Christians. Voluntarily transgress a law which carries with it capital punishment is not martyrdom, but suicide. And the pity we cannot help feeling for the martyrs of Cordoba is the same that one entertains for many less exalted form of hysterical disorder. The victims were indeed martyrs to disease, and their fate is as pitiable as though they had really been martyrs for the faith. The leading spirit of this suicide was Eulogius, a priest who belonged to an old family of Cordova, always noted for its Christian zeal. Eulogius had spent years in prayer and fasting, in bitter penance and self-mortification, and had reduced himself to the ecstatic condition which leads to acts of misguided but heroic devotion. There was nothing worldly left in him, no thought for himself or personal ambition to cover the false faith of the moors with contumely and to awaken a spirit of exalted devotion among his co-religionists such were his aims in these he had throughout the cordial support of wealthy young men of cordova alvaro by name and a small but forbid body of priests monks and women with a few laymen among those who found a close affinity to the devoted young priest was a beautiful girl named Flora. She was the child of a mixed marriage, and her Christian mother had brought her up secretly in her own faith. For many years, Flora was to all outward appearance a Mohammedan, but at length, moved by the same spirit of sacrifice and enthusiasm which had stirred Eulogius, and excited by such passages in the Bible, as, Whoso shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. She fled from her brother's house, her father was dead, and took refuge among the Christians. The brother, a Mohammedan, searched for her in vain. Many priests were thrown into prison on the charge of being accomplices in the abduction, and Flora, unwilling that others should suffer through her fault, returned to her home and confessed herself a Christian. Her brother tried the sternest means at his disposal to compel her to recant, and at last, in a rage at her obstinacy, brought her before the caddy, or Mohammedan judge, and accused her of apostasy. The child of a Muslim, even though the mother be a Christian, is held in Mohammedan law to be born a Muslim. 
an apostasy has always been punishable by death. Even now in Turkey, the law holds good, though there has been a tacit understanding for the last forty years that it shall not be enforced. And a thousand years ago, we must expect to find less tenderness toward the renegades. Yet the judge before whom Flora was thus arraigned displayed some compunction toward the unhappy girl. He did not condemn her to death, as he was in law bound to do so, or even to imprisonment. He had her severely beaten and told her brother to take her home and instruct her in the Mahomedan religion. She escaped, however, again, and took refuge with some Christian friends, and here for the first time she met Eulogius, who conceived for the beautiful and unfortunate young devotee a pure and tender love such as angels might feel for one another. Her mystical exaltation, devout piety, and unconquerable courage gave her the aspect of a saint in his eyes, and he had not forgotten a detail of their first interview six years later when she wrote to her these words though disdain holy sister to show me thy neck torn by the scourge and shorn of the beautiful locks that once hung over it it was because thou didst regard me as thy spiritual father and believe me to be pure and chaste as thyself softly did i lay my hand on thy wounds i had it in me to seek to heal them with my lips had i dared when I parted from thee, I was as one that walked in a dream, and I sighed without ceasing. Flora and her sister, who shared her enthusiasm, were removed to a safe place of concealment, and Eulogius did not see her again for some time. Meanwhile, the zeal of Cordovan Christian was bearing fruits. A foolish priest, Perfectus, had been led into cursing the dominant religion, and had been executed on a great Mohammedan fast day, when all the world was rejoicing at the termination of the rigorous fast of Ramadan, which had lasted a whole month. The Muslims, men and women, made this feast a special occasion of merry-making, and the execution of the offending priest added a new subject of excitement to the crowds that thronged the streets and sailed on the river and flourished on the great plain outside the city. The poor priest died bravely, causing Mohammed and his religion with his last breath, surrounded by a vast crowd of scoping and pitiless Muslims. The bishop of Cordoba, followed by an army of priests and devotees, took down his body, buried him with the holy relics of St. Asisculus a martyr of Diocletian's persecution, in whose church he had officiated, and forthwith had him made a saint. The same evening two Muslims were drowned, and this was at once accepted as the judgment of God on the murderers of Perfectus. The black slave, Nasr, who had superintended the execution, died within the year, and the Christians triumphantly declared that Perfectus had predicted this disease. It was another judgment. Soon a monk named Isaac sought an interview with the Cadi, on the pretext of wishing to be converted to the Mohammedan religion. But no sooner had the learned judge explained the doctrines of Islam than the would-be convert turned around and began to heap maledictions upon the creed which he had asked to be taught. It was no marvel that the astonished caddy gave him a cough. Do you know, said he, that our law condemns people to death for daring to speak as you have spoken? I do, answered the monk. Condemn me to death? I desire it, for I know that the Lord said, Blessed are they who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The caddy was sorry for the man, and begged the sultan, to overlook his crime, but in vain. Isaac was decapitated, and thereupon became a saint, and it was proved conclusively that he had worked many miracles, not only ever since his childhood, but even before he came into the world. Presently, one of the sultan's guard, Sancho, a pupil of Eulogius, blasphemed Mohammed and lost his head. 
Next Sunday, six monks rushed before the Kadi and shouted, We too say what our holy brothers Isaac and Sancho said, and forthwith fell to blaspheming Mohammed and to crying, Avenge your accursed prophet, treat us with all your barbarity. Their heads were cut off. Three more priests or monks, infected with the fervor of suicide, rushed excitedly to present their necks to the headsmen. Eleven thus fell in less than two months during the summer of 851. The great body of the Christians were dismayed at the indiscreet zeal of their brethren. It must not be forgotten that the Spaniards had not so far been remarkable for religious fervor. Their creed sat lightly upon them, and so many of them had been converted to Islam that the two creeds and the two peoples had become to a considerable extent mixed together in friendly intercourse. The Christians had come to despise their old Latin language and literature. They learned Arabic and soon were able to write it as well as the Arabs themselves. Elodius himself deplores this change. The Christians, he says, delight in the Arabic poems and romances instead of the Holy Scripture and the works of the fathers. The younger generation know only Arabic. They read the Muslims' book with other, form great libraries of them, and find them admirable, while they will not glance a Christian book. They are forgetting their own language, he adds, and hardly one in thousand can write a decent Latin letter yet they indict excellent arabic verse the christians in fact found arab romances and poetry much more entertaining than the writings of the fathers of the church they were growing more and more arab more civilized more refined and also more indifferent to distinctions of faith they were grateful to the moors for treating them well and the sudden animosity displayed by their excited brethren amazed and shocked them. They endeavored to avert the threatening storm by showing their brethren the futility of their conduct. They argued with them, remind them how tolerant the Muslims had always been to Christians, recall to them the peaceful teaching of the gospel and the words of the apostle that slanderers shall not enter the kingdom of heaven, and told them how the Muslims regard these deaths with no disquietude, for they argued, if your religion were true, God would have avenged his martyrs. These worthy Christians of common kind, who knew not the force of spiritual exaltation for good and for evil, and only did their duty to their neighbors and said their prayers in the simple old-fashioned manner, tried in vain to restrain the zealots. They perceived that this continued insult and swift following punishments must at last end in real persecution. Eulogius, on the contrary, who set himself to answer their objection with text out of the Bible and the lives of the saints, coveted such a result, and the zealots desired nothing better than the fire of persecution. The ecclesiastical authorities, worked upon by the moderate party, and also by the Moorish government, could not permit the spirit of revolt to continue much longer unreproved. The bishops met in council under the presidentship of the Metropolitan of Seville, and though they could not precisely repudiate the former martyrdoms, since the church had already canonized the sufferers, yet they ordained that no more exhibitions of the kind should be made, and in furtherance of this decision, the leaders of the zealots were thrown into prison. Here Eulogius met Flora again. She had been praying earnestly one day in a church when she saw beside her a fellow enthusiast, a sister of that monk Isaac, who had been one of the earliest martyrs. Mary wanted to join her brother in the kingdom of heaven, and Flora resolved to accompany her. They went before the caddy and did their best to excite his anger by blaspheming the name of Mohammed and his religion. Two young and beautiful girls, professing most sincerely the religion of peace on earth and goodwill towards men, stood before the magistrate with lips full of cursing and bitterness, reviling his faith as the work of the devil. 
but the good judge was not to be roused so easily. He was weary of all this hysterical mania, and had many a time pretended to be deaf when people thrust themselves upon death. He thought it was a pity of those two girls, and wished they would not be so foolish. He would try to induce them to retract, or make as though he had not heard, but they persisted in their heroic purpose, and he had to put them in prison. Here, in the long confinement, the maidens were daunted, and almost inclined to waver in their sacrificial ardor, when Eulogius came to strengthen and destroy them. His task was the hardest in the world, to encourage the woman whom he loved with all his soul to go to the scaffold. Yet, in spite of every natural and human feeling, this man of iron nerved himself to fan the flame of enthusiasm to the point of martyrdom. It was a daily agony to the unhappy priest, but he never relaxed his efforts in what he believed to be the good cause. He even wrote an entire treatise to convince Flora, who needed but little, of the supreme beauty and glory of martyrdom for the faith. He spent his days and nights in reading and writing, to banish from his heart those feelings and compunction and love which threatened to shake his resolution. But it was only too firm. Flora and Mary remained constant and undismayed in spite of the anxious efforts of the caddy to help them to save themselves, and after the final interview, when sentence of death was pronounced, Eulogius saw Flora. She seemed to me an angel, he wrote afterwards, glorying in the spiritual triumph. A celestial illumination surrounded her, her face lightened with happiness. She seemed already to be tasting the joys of the heavenly home. When I heard the word of her sweet mouth, I sought to establish her in a resolve by showing her the crown that waited her. I worshipped her, I fell down before this angel, and besought her to remember me in her prayers, and strengthened by her speech, I returned less sad to my somber cell. Flora and her companion Mary were executed at last, 24th November 851, and Eulogius wrote a paean of joy to celebrate what he deemed the great victory of the church. Soon after this, Eulogius and the other priests were released from prison, and the next year, Abderrahman II died and was succeeded by his son Mohammed, a rigid, cold-hearted egotist, who screwed savings out of the salaries of his ministers and was universally detested for his meanness and unworthiness. The theologians alone liked him, for he seemed likely to avenge to the full the insult which the excited Christians had poured upon the Mohammedan religion. Churches were demolished, and such severe persecution was set on foot that though many Christians had become Muslims when the bishops had officially condemned suicidal martyrdom, many more now followed their example. Indeed, according to Eulogios and Alvaro, the majority recanted. The wise and kindly policy of Abdul Rahman and his ministers, who shut their eyes when the Christians were wantonly committing themselves, was now exchanged for a policy of cruel repression, and it is no wonder that apostasy was the rule. Still, the influence of the little band of zealots were powerful, and had already extended far beyond the limit of Cordoba. Toledo made Eulogius its bishop, and when the sultan refused his consent, the primacy was kept vacant until the zealots should be permitted to occupy it. Two French monks came to Cordoba to beg some relics of holy martyrs and went back to saint germain de pre with handsome bag of bones which were presently displayed to the faithful at Paris. But a heavy blow was about to fall upon the enthusiasts. Another girl deserted her parents to follow Eulogius, and this time she and her teacher were brought before the cadi. Eulogius was guilty only of proselytizing and his legal punishment was but a scourging. But the priest was not made of the stuff that endures the whip. Humble and long-suffering before his God, willing to inflict any torture on his own body for the sake of the faith, he could not submit to be flogged by the infidel. 
Make sharp thy sword, judge, he cried. Send my soul to meet my creator, but think not that I will suffer my body to be lacerated with whips. And here he burst into a flood of maledictions against Mohammed and his religion. The Kadi would not take upon himself the responsibility of executing the sentence upon so prominent a leader as Eulogius, and the priest was accordingly brought before the privy council. One of the body expostulated with him, and asked why a man of sense and education should voluntarily run his head into peril of death. He could understand fools and maniacs doing so, he said, but Eulogius was of a different stamp. Listen to me, he added, I entreat you, yield for once to necessity. Retract what you said before the Kadi, and say but the word, and you shall go free. But it was too late. Eulogius, though he preferred the position of train of martyrs to setting the example himself, could not retreat from his ground with dignity. He must go on to the bitter end, and refusing to retract anything, he was forthwith led out to execution and died with the courage and devotion on March 11, 859. Deprived of their leader, the Christian martyrs lost heart, and we do not hear of their mad devotion again. End of chapter 5Chapter six of the Moors in Spain by Stanley Lane Poole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Great Caliph. My readers may perhaps be disappointed that so far we have but few records of noble deeds or great wars, and that instead of individual heroes, we have been chiefly interested in large movements of races and religions. We had, it is true, a stirring outset with Tariq and his Berbers, whose brilliant conquests are no more legendary than is the history of the 19th century. We had the great and decisive Battle of Tours, but of this the details, which might have proved of surpassing interest, are wanting, and the other engagement with the Franks, the field of Roncesvalles, errs in the opposite direction for it is overclouded with myth. Since that day, a hundred years have now passed, and we have come to the death of Eulogius and the consequent decline of Christian martyrs, and in all that century we have been reading of nothing but the struggle between the different races and creeds that made up the mixed population of Spanish peninsula. But after all, golden deeds are rare, and are too often the invention of poets, whose spiritual minds, clothed with the attributes of ideal chivalry, were really the ordinary events of war, while the struggle of race with race and creed with creed is what the world has been incessantly witnessing ever since man came into existence. We must not allow ourselves to think that the history of this large movement is uninteresting because it has not the personal charm of individual acts of heroism. In the devotion of countless unnoticed men and women during the piteous epoch of martyrdom at Cordova, there was perhaps more real heroism than in the impetuous deeds of chivalry displayed by rude warriors on the battlefield. It is much easier to be brave in hot blood than to endure the alarms and sufferings of long imprisonment to look forward with undaunted courage to the day of execution and keep a firm heart through it all. The Christian martyrs were misguided. They threw away their lives without cause, but their courage is as worthy of admiration as their wisdom is to be pitied. Flora was as real a heroine as if she had sacrificed herself for a worthy sake. Eulogius, with all his bigotry, was of the true hero's mold. And in all these great movements of race or faith, there are numberless acts of devotion and fortitude which, though they may escape the eye of the historian, call for as much resolution and endurance as the most brilliant exploits of the soldier. It is often in the little acts of heroism that the hardest duty of mankind are found, and in the conflicts between large bodies of people 
there are endless opportunities for their exercise. It is much easier to realize heroic character in a person than in a whole people or even a city. And we are now coming to the career of men who approached as few have ever done the high idea of kingly greatness. A great king is the result of great need. When the nation is so beset, when the times are full of presage of disaster, and ruin hangs ominously on the horizon, then the great king comes to rescue his people from danger, to restore order and well-being, and to reign over a realm once more made happy and prosperous by his efforts. The needs of such a ruler was anxiously felt at the beginning of the 10th century in Spain. The excited conduct of Christians of Cordoba had been followed by a still more dangerous and widespread rebellion in the provinces. The throne was occupied by incapable sovereigns. For the energetic policy of Mundir, who had succeeded his father Mohammed in 886, was arrested by his assassination in 888, and his brother Abdallah, who had instigated the murder, was incapable of dealing courageously with the numerous sources of danger which then menaced the kingdom. His policy was shift and temporizing. He alternately tried the effects of force and conciliation, with the usual consequence that both policy failed, and he was personally so despicable, cruel, vile, that all parties in his dominion seemed for once to be agreed in their detestation of him and they resolved to cast off his rule. He had hardly been reigning three years when the greater part of Andalusia was virtually independent. All the various sections of the states were now again in active opposition to the central power. Every nobleman or chief, were he Arab, Berber or Spaniard, seized the opportunity of bad and weak sovereign, and general anarchy to appropriate a portion of the land for his own exclusive benefit and from behind his ramparts to defy the sultan. The old Arab aristocracy, the descendants of the Arab tribes who completed the conquest of Spain, were few and greatly outnumbered by other races, but though their weakness should have kept them loyal to the Arab kingdom of Cordoba, they too turned against it and established themselves in independent princedoms, especially at Seville, which now became a formidable rival to Cordoba. In other cities, though the Arabs were not strong enough to break openly with the Sultan, they gave him but a nominal homage, and the governors of Lorca and Zaragoza were really quite independent of their feeble king. In no places outside Cordoba, where the mercenary guards of the sultan compelled a certain outward submission, were the Arabs to be counted upon for the defense of the Omeyyad power. The Berbers were more numerous than the Arabs, and at least equally disaffected. They had abandoned any pretense of submission to the sultan's authority, and had returned to their old political system of clan government. The western provinces of Spain, such as Extremadura, and the south of Portugal were now the independent possessions of the Berbers, and they also held various important posts, such as Jaén, in Andalusia itself. The Berber family of Dunun, consisting of the father Musa, a great scoundrel and an abominable thief, and his three sons, who resembled him in their physical strength and their unrivaled brutality, carried fire and sword through the land, and burnt, sacked, massacred wherever they went. The Mohammedan Spaniards, who had put on something of Arab civilization along with their new faith, were by no means barbarians like the Berbers, but they were not the less hostile to the central power. The province of Algarve, at the southwest corner of the peninsula, was entirely in their power, and they held numerous independent cities and districts throughout Andalusia. Indeed, all the most important cities were in secret or open revolt. Arab governors, Berber chiefs, Spanish renegades alike joined in repudiating or disregarding the sovereign authority of Abdallah, and most powerful of all, even Hapsun, a Christian who had raised the mountaineers of the province of Elvira, Granada, 
reigned in perfect security in his rocky fastness, Bobastro, and gave laws to the regions around. Again and again had the Sultan attacked him, and each time suffered defeat. Now he was disposed to try the ignominious policy of conciliation, only to find Ibn Hafsun quite ready to trick him at that. Murcia, the land of Theodomir, was independent under a mild and cultivated renegade prince, who governed his subject wisely and was beloved by them who was devoted to poetry, but did not neglect to keep up a considerable army, which included 5,000 horsemen. Toledo was, as usual, in revolt, and nothing but the jealousies and divisions of the Christians of the north prevented them from reconquering their long-lost territories. Split up as it was into the numberless little seigniories, resembling rather the estate or counties of feudal barons than portions of one's powerful realm, Andalusia could have offered but an ill-directed resistance to a determined invader. There were, of course, some glimpses of light amidst all this anarchy. We have said that the province of Murcia was ruled by an enlightened and benevolent prince. The lord of Caslona was also distinguished for his patronage of poets and the arts. His halls were raised upon marble pillars, and the walls were encrusted with marble and gold, all that makes life enjoyable was to be found within his palace. Even Hajjaj, too, the Arab king, for he was nothing less, of Seville, who had compelled the sultan to come to terms with him and make him his friends, exercised his unbounded authority in the noblest manner. His city was admirably governed, order reigned there undisturbed, and evildoers were sternly but justly punished. He kept his state like an emperor, five hundred cavaliers formed his escort, and his royal robe was of brocade, with his name and title embroidered on it in gold thread. Kings from over the sea sent him present, silken stuffs from Egypt, learned doctors of law from Medina, and matchless singers from Baghdad. The beautiful lady, Moon, renowned for her lovely voice, her eloquence and poetic fire, sang of him thus in all the west i find no right nobleman save ibrahim but he is nobility itself when one has known the delight of living with him to dwell in any other land would be misery the very poets of cordoba were attracted to his brilliant court where they were sure of a princely welcome only once did a poet receive a cold greeting from ibrahim the son of hajaj this was one who thought to please the prince by reciting a scurrilous poem on the nobles of Cordoba, to whom the ruler of Seville was not well disposed. You are mistaken, was Ibn Hajjaj's comment. If you think that a man like myself can find any gratification in listening to these base calumnies. Yet, these occasional flashes of enlightenment cannot make amends for the general condition of anarchy to which Andalusia had become a prey by the weakening of the central power and the aggrandizement of countless petty rulers and brigand chiefs. The country was in deplorable states, and Cordoba itself now threatened even with the conquest at the hands of Ibn Hafsun and his bold mountaineers was given over to mournful sadness. Without being yet actually besieged, she was already suffering all the ills of beleaguerment. Cordoba, said the Arab historians, was in the condition of frontier town exposed to all the attacks of the enemy. Time after time the inhabitants were startled from their sleep in the midst of night by the cries of distress raised by the wretched peasant across the river when the horseman of Pole was setting the sword to their throats. The state is menaced with total dissolution, wrote a contemporary witness. Disaster follows one another ceaselessly, thieving and pillaging going on. Our wives and children are dragged into slavery. There were universal complaints of the certain want of energy, of his weakness and his baseness. The troops were grumbling because they were not paid. The province had stopped the supplies and the treasury was empty. What money the sultan had been able to borrow, he spent to bribe the few Arabs 
who still affected to support him in the provinces. The deserted markets show how trade had been destroyed. Bread had reached a fabulous price. Nobody believed any longer in the future. Despair had sunk into all hearts. The bigots, who regarded all public misfortune as the chastisement of God and called Ibn Hafsun the scourge of the divine rats, afflict the city with their doleful prophecies. Woe to thee, Cordoba, they cried. Woe to thee, sink of defilement and decay, abode of calamity and anguish, thou who hast neither friends nor ally, when the captain, with his great nose and ugly face, he who is guarded before by Moslems and behind by idolaters, when Ibn Hafsun comes before thy gates, then will thy awful fate be accomplished. When things were at the worst, a gleam of hope shone upon the miserable inhabitants of the royal city. Abdallah, who was quite as despairing as his subject, tried for once a bold policy, and in spite of the discouragement of his followers, and the overwhelming numbers of the enemy who surrounded him on every side, he contrived to win a few advantages. Then he did the best thing that he could do for his country. He died on October 15, 912, aged 68, after a reign of 24 unhappy years. His life had seen the fall of the Umayyad power, a fall sudden and apparently irremediable. The reign of his successor was destined to see as sudden, as complete, a restoration of that power. The new sultan was Abdurrahman III, a grandson of Abdallah. He was only twenty-one when he came to the throne, and there were several uncles and other kinsmen who might be expected to oppose the succession of mere youth at so troublous a time. Yet no one made any resistance, on the contrary, his accession was hailed with satisfaction on all sides. The young prince had already succeeded in winning the favor of the people and the court. His handsome presence and princely bearing, joined to a singular grace of manner and acknowledged powers of mind, made him generally popular, and it was with a feeling of renewed hope that the Cordovans, who were almost the only subject he had left, watched the first proceedings of the new sultan. Abderrahman made no attempt to disguise his intentions. He abandoned, once and for all, the policy of his grandfather, which, in his alternate weakness and cruelty, had worked such injury to the state, and in its place he announced that he would permit no disobedience throughout the dominions of the Umayyad. He summoned the disaffected nobles and chieftains to submit to his authority, and he let it be clearly understood that he would leave no portion of his kingdom under the control of rebels. The program was bold enough to satisfy the most sanguine, but there seemed every probability that it would unite all the rebels in all parts in one great league to crush the dauntless young prince. But Abderrahman knew his countrymen, and his boldness was well founded. Nearly a generation had passed since Ibn Hafsun and the other rebels had raised the standard of insurrection, and everyone had come to feel that there had been enough of it. The early zeal that had prompted the Spaniards, Muslim and Christian alike, to strike a blow for their national independence had now cooled. Such movements never last unless they achieve the complete success at the first white heat of enthusiasm. The leaders were either dead or aged, and a calmer spirit had come over their followers. People had begun to ask themselves what was the good that they obtained by their fine revolutions. They had not freed Andalusia from the infidel, but had, contrarywise, given her over to the worst members of the infidel ranks to brigand chiefs and adventurers of the vilest stamp. The country was harried from end to end by bands of lawless robbers who destroyed the tilled fields and vineyard and turned the land into a howling wilderness. Anything was better than the tyranny of brigandage. The Sultan of Cordoba could not make matters worse than they were, and there was a general disposition to see whether he might not possibly improve them. 
Consequently, when Abd er Rahman began to lead his army against the rebellious provinces, he found them more than half willing to submit. His troops were inspirited to see their gallant young sovereign at their head, a sight that Abdallah had not committed them for many years, and they followed him with enthusiasm. The rebels, already tired of their anarchic condition, opened their gates after mere show of resistance. One after another, the great cities of Andalusia submitted the sultan within their walls. The country to the south of Cordoba was the first to submit, then Seville opened her gates, the Berbers of the west were reduced to obedience, and the prince of Algarve hastened to offer tribute. Then the sultan advanced against the Christians of the province of Regio, where for the thirty years the mountainous fastness had protected the bold subject of Ibn Hafsun, and where no one knew better than Abdurrahman that no speedy victory was to be won. Yet, step by step, this difficult region was subdued. Seeing the scrupulous justice and honor of the sultan, who kept his treaties with the Christians in perfect good faith, and observed the utmost clemency to those who submitted to him, fortress after fortress surrendered. Even Hapsun himself, in his fastness, remained unconquered and as defiant as ever, but he was old and soon he died, and then it was only a matter of time for the arms of the sultan to penetrate even into Babastro. When the sultan stood at last upon the ramparts of this redoubtable fortress and looked down from its dizzy heights upon the cliffs and precipices that surround the rebel stronghold, he was overcome with emotion and fell upon his knees to render thanks to God for the great victory. Then he turned to acts of mercy and pardon and all the days he stayed in the fort he observed the solemn fest. Murcia had now given in its allegiance to the sultan, and Toledo alone remained unsubdued. The proud city on the Tagus haughtily rejected Abdel Rahman's offer of amnesty, and confidently awaited the siege. But it had to do with the different assailant from the feeble generals, who had from time to time reaped disgrace beneath the walls of the royal city. To prove to its defenders that his siege was no transitory menace, the sultan quickly built a little town, which he called El Feth, Victory, on the opposite mountain, and there he resided in calm anticipation of the result. Pressed by famine, the city surrendered, and Abdel Rahman III entered the last seat of rebellion in the dominions which he had inherited from his namesake, the first Abdel Rahman, which now, 930, once more reached to their full extent. It had taken 18 years to recover the whole breadth of dominion which his predecessor had lost, but the work was done, and the royal power was firmly established over Arabs, Berbers, Spaniards, Muslims, and Christians alike. Henceforward, Abdel Rahman permitted no special prominence to any party. He kept the old Arab nobility in severe repression and the Spaniards, who had always been treated by them as base canale, rejoiced to see their oppressors brought law. Henceforth the sultan was sole authority in the states, but his authority was just, enlightened, and tolerant. After so many years of confusion and anarchy, the people accepted the new despotism cheerfully. There were no more brigands to destroy their crops and vines, and if the sultan was absolute in his power, at least he did not abuse it. The country folk returned to the path of peace and plenty. They were at last free to get rich and to be happy after their own way. End of chapter 6chapter 7 of the Moors in Spain by Stanley Lane Poole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Holy War. Abdel Rahman III's principle of government consisted in retaining the sovereign power entirely in his own hands and administering the kingdom by officers who owed their elevation wholly to his favor. Above all, he took care to leave no power in the hands of the old Arab aristocracy who had so ill served previous rulers. The men he appoints to high places were pavanous 
people of mean birth, who were the more attached to their master because they knew that but for him they would be trampled upon by old Arab families. The force he employed to sustain the central power was a large standing army, at the head of which stood his select bodyguards of Slavs or purchased foreigners. They were originally composed chiefly of men of Slavonian nationality, but came by degrees to include Franks, Galicians, Lombards, and all sorts of people who were brought to Spain by Greek and Venetian traders and sold while still children to the Sultan to be educated as Muslims. Many of them were highly cultivated men and naturally attached to their master. They resembled in many respects the core of Mamluks, which Saladin's successor introduced into Egypt as a bodyguard and which subsequently attained such renown as sultans of Egypt and Syria. Like that body of purchased Turkish and Circassian slaves, they had their own slaves under them, were granted estates by the Sultan, and formed a sort of feudal retainers, prepared to serve their lord at the head of their own followers whenever he might call upon them. Like the Egyptian Mamluks, too, they came after a while to such a pitch of influence that they took advantage of the decay of the central power, which followed upon the death of Abdelhamman III and his successor to found independent dynasties for themselves and thus contribute to the final overthrow of the Muslim domination in Spain. With the aid of his Slavs, the sultans not only banished brigandage and rebellion from Spain, but waged war with the Christians of the north with brilliant success. The Mohammedan realm was menaced by more dangers than those of internal anarchy. It was pressed between two threatening and warlike kingdoms, each of which required to be kept in watchful check. To the south, the newly founded empire of the Fatimite caliphs in North Africa was a standing menace. It was natural that the rulers of the Barbary coast should remember that the Arabs before them had used Africa as a stepping stone to Spain. The traditional policy of the African dynasty was to compass if possible, the annexation of the fair provinces of Andalusia. It was only by skillfully working upon the sectarian schisms and consequent insurrections which divided the Berbers of Africa that the Sultan succeeded in keeping the Fatimites at distance. He did succeed, however, so well that at one time a great part of the Barbary coast paid homage to the ruler of Spain who also obtained possession of the important fortress of Ceuta. A great part of the Spanish revenue was devoted to building a magnificent fleet, with which Abdel Rahman disputed with the Fatimites the commands of the Mediterranean. On the opposite side, on the north, the Muslim power had to deal with even more threatening enemy. The Christians of the Astrias had sprung from very small beginning but they were now increasing in strength, and they had the stimulating thought spur them on that they were reconquering their own land. When first they had felt the shock of the Muslim invasion, their rout had been utter and complete. They had fled to the mountains of the Astrias, where their trifling numbers and the inaccessibility of their situation gave them safety from the Mohammedan attack. Pelagius, the old Pelayo of the ballad had but thirty men and ten women with him in the cave of a Covadonga, which became the refuge of the Gothic Christians, and the Arabs did not think it worth while to hunt down the little remnant of the refugees. Here, in the recesses of the cave, which was approached through a long and narrow mountain pass and entered by a ladder of ninety steps, a handful of men might have set an army at defiance. The Arab historians thus contemptuously describe the origin of Christian kingdom. During Anbasa's administration, a despicable barbarian, whose name was Pelai, rose in the land of Galicia, and having reproached his countrymen for their ignominious dependence and their cowardly flight, began to stir them up to avenge their past injuries and to expel the Muslims from the land of their fathers. 
From that moment, the Christians of Andalus began to resist the attacks of the Moslems on such districts as had remained in their possession, and to defend their wives and daughters. The commencement of the rebellion happened thus. There remained no city, town, or village in Galicia but what was in the hand of the Moslems, with the exception of steep mountain on which this Pelayo took refuge with a handful of men. There his followers went on dying through hunger until he saw their numbers reduced to about thirty men and ten women, having no other food for support than the honey which they gathered in the crevices of rock which they themselves inhabited like so many bees. However, Pelayo and his men fortified themselves by degrees in the passes of the mountain until the Moslems were made acquainted with their preparations. But, perceiving how few they were, they heeded not the advice conveyed to them, and allowed them to gather strength, saying, What are thirty barbarians perched up on a rock? They must inevitably die. Would to God, add another historian, would to God that the Moslems had then extinguished at once the sparks of fire which was destined to consume the whole dominion of Islam in those parts. The little band of refugees was strengthened from time to time by fresh accessions, and by degrees waxing more confident, came forth from their stronghold and began to harass the Berbers who formed the frontier settlers. The Moors were at length compelled to seek out the intrepid raiders in their cavern, but the result was discouraging. They were driven back pell-mell with great loss. In 751, Alfonso of Cantabria, where the Muslims had never penetrated, having married the daughter of Pelaya and thus united the Christian forces, roused the northern provinces against the Moors, and joined by the Galicians of the west, began a series of brilliant campaigns by which the enemy was driven step by step further south. One after the other, the cities of Braga, Porto, Astorga, Leon, Zamora, Ledesma, Salamanca, Saldana, Segovia, Avila, Osma, Miranda were recovered from the Moslems, and the Christian frontier was now pushed as far as the great Sierra and Coimbra, Korea, Talavera, Toledo, Guadalajara, Tudela, and Pamplona became the Muslim border fortresses. Alfonso had in fact recovered the provinces of Old Castile, Leon, Asturias, and Galicia, but the scanty band of Christians had neither money nor serfs wherewith to build fortifications and cultivate the fields over so immense an area. They contented themselves with leaving the conquered country as a debatable land between them and the Moors, and retired to the district bordering the Bay of Biscay until such time as their numbers should justify the occupation of wider area. In the ninth century, they were in a position to advance upon the territory they had already in part recovered from the Moors. They spread over Leon and built the fortress of Zamora, San Esteban de Gormas, Osma, and Simancas to overawe the enemy. The debatable land was now much narrower, and the hostile forces were almost in contact at various places along the frontier. At the beginning of the 10th century, the Moors of the borders made a strenuous effort to regain their lost dominions, but the Christians, aided by the men of Toledo and by Sancho, king of Navarre, who had become the bulwark of Christianity in the north, defeated them severely and began to harry the country over the border. The forays of the Christians were a terrible cause to their victims. They were rude, unlettered people, and few of them could even read. Their manners were on par with their education, and their fanaticism and cruelty were what might be expected from such uncouth barbarians. Seldom did the soldiery of the Leon give quarter to a defenseless foe, and we may look in vain for the fine chivalry and toleration of the Arabs where the latter spared nobly, the rough robbers of Leon and Castile massacred whole garrisons, cities full of inhabitants, and those whom they did not slaughter, they made slaves. Abdel Rahman III had hardly been seated two years on the throne when Ordoño II of Leon carried the devastating foray to the walls of Merida 
and so affrighted were the people of Badajoz that they hastened to conciliate him with blackmail. These cities are not very far from Cordova, only the lofty heights of the Sierra Morena separated the capital of Omeyad from the companies of Ordoño. The situation was fraught with danger. The young sultan, had he been a coward, might have excused himself from instant action on the plea that the Merida had not yet recognized his authority, and that it was not his affair if the Christians harried rebellious provinces. This, however, was not Abdel Rahman's policy or temper. He collected his troops and sent an expedition to the north, which made a successful raid into Christian territories, and the following year, 917, he ordered a second attack. This was defeated with heavy loss by Ordoño before the walls of San Esteban de Gormas, and the brave Arab general, seeing that the fight was lost, threw himself among the enemy and died sword in hand. The king of Leon had the pitiful cowardice to nail the head of this gallant soldier to the gate of the fortress, side by side with that of a pig. Encouraged by this success, the armies of Leon and Navarre ravaged the country about Tudela in the following year, but not with equal impunity, for they were twice beaten by the Cordoban troops. Seeing, however, that it took a great deal of defeat to taunt the Christians, Abdel Rahman resolved upon a stronger measure. In 920, he took command of the army himself, and by rapid marches and skillful strategy, surprised Osma and raised the fortress to the ground. Destroyed San Esteban, which he found deserted by its garrison, and then turned toward Navarre. Twice did he drive Sancho from the field, and when the forces of Navarre was reinforced by those of Leon, and the Christians had the best of the natural position, the sultan delivered battle with them in the Val de Junqueras, Vale of Riz, and totally routed their combined array. Incensed by the obstinate defense of the borderers, the Muslims put the garrison of Muez to the sword, and it is unfortunately true that in some of these campaigns the Moors imitate the barbarity of their antagonists, especially when their armies included a considerable admixture of African troops, who were notoriously savage. Nothing could exceed the heroic determination of the defeated Christians. Barbarous they were, but they had the courage of men. Routed again and again, they ever rose with fresh heart from the disaster. The very year after the fatal battle in the Valley of Riz, Ordoño, who was the soul of the Christian resistance, led his men on another raid over the borders, and in 923, Sancho of Navarre, not to be behind-handed, recaptured some strong castles. Thus roused once more, the sultan set out for the north, filled with a stern resolve, he sacked and burned all that came in his way. The cities emptied as he approached. So terrible was the dread he inspired, and he entered the deserted capital Pamplona, driving Sancho away in confusion as he approached. The cathedral and many of the houses of the capital were ruthlessly destroyed, and Navarre was at his feet. About the same time, Ordoño of Leon died, and the civil war which arose between his sons gave the sultan time to attend to other matters. On his return from this triumphant campaign, Abdel Rahman III assumed a new title. Hitherto, the rulers of Andalusia had contented themselves with such titles as Emir, Governor, Sultan, Dominator, Son of the Caliphs. Although they were the heirs of the Umayyad Caliphs and never recognized the Abbasides who had overturned them, the Andalusian Sultans had not hitherto asserted their claim to the spiritual title. They had considered that the name of Caliph should not be held by those who had no authority over the holy cities of Islam, Mecca and Medina, and had been content to leave the Abbasides in undisputed possession of the name. Now, however, when it was known in Spain that the Abbasid caliphs no longer exercised any real authority outside the city of Baghdad and were little better than prisoners even there, in consequence of the growing independence of the various local dynasties. Abdel Rahman, in 929, 
assumed his title of Caliph with the style of En Nasir Lidin La, the defender of the faith of God. The Caliph had still thirty years more to reign when he adopted this new name, and they were filled chiefly with wise and cultivated administration at home, and with constant, even annual expeditions against the Christians, against whom he was indeed a defender of his religion. The civil war, which had for a time neutralized the power of the Leonese, had now given place to the authority of a worthy successor of the great Ordoño. Ramiro II succeeded in 931, and his warlike character soon asserted itself in resolute opposition to the caliph's armies. Not long afterwards, a formidable league was formed in the north between the Christians and the Arab governor of Zaragoza, and Abderrahman hastened to demolish the coalition. In 937, he reduced Zaragoza and, marching on Navarre, spread such terror around his way that the queen regent, Teuda, hastily paid him homage as a suzerain. Ramiro, however, was no party to this surrender. He gathered his men together and inflicted a tremendous defeat on the Muslims in 939 at Alhandega. Fifty thousand Moors fell upon the field. The caliph himself barely escaped with his life and found himself flying through the country with less than fifty horsemen. That disastrous year was long known in Andalusia as the year of Alhandega. Had the Christians pressed their advantage, a different history of Spain would perhaps have had to be written. But as usual, internecine jealousies among the Christian princes came to the help of the caliph, and while his force quarreled among themselves, he repaired his disaster, recruited his army, and made ready for another campaign. The civil war which thus aided him had its origin in the revolt of Castile from the Leonese supremacy. The Count of Castile at this time was the celebrated Fernando González, of whom many minstrels have sung. He is one of the great Spanish heroes and was mated to a heroine. Twice did his wife rescue him from the prison into which he had been cast by his jealous neighbors of Navarre and Leon, and second time she did it by exchanging clothes with her husband and exposing herself to the fury of his jailers. The earlier occasion was before their marriage, when he was on his way to her father Garcia's court at Navarre to ask her hand in marriage, and the perfidious king laid hands upon him. A ballad tells the story of his release. They have carried afar into Navarre the great Count of Castile, and they have bound him sorely, they have bound him hand and heel, and there is joy and feasting because that lord is taken. King Garcia in his dungeon holds the doubtest lord in Spain. The poet goes on to tell how a Norman knight was riding through Navarre. For Christ, his hope he came to cope with the Moorish scimitar, and how he told Garcia's daughter of the captivity of Gonzales, and how grievous an injury it was the cause of Christian Spain. The Moors may well be joyful, but great should be our grief. For Spain has lost a guardian when Castile has lost a chief. The Moorish host is pouring like a river over the land. Curse on the Christian fetters that binds Gonzales' hand. And the Norman knights prayed the princess to set the prisoner free. The lady answered little, but at the murk of night, when all her maids are sleeping, she had risen and taken a flight. She had tempted the alcaide with her jewels and her gold, and unto her his prisoner that jailer force had sold. So the princess took the count out of his dungeon, and together they rode to Castile. At the time we have now reached, this is an old story, for Gonzales had been married a many a year, and had determined that Castile should be a separate kingdom, no longer under suzerainty of Leon. For this he had again captured and imprisoned by Ramiro, and only released when it was apparent that the people of Castile would have no other lord but him, and would even pay their homage to a mere statue of their count sooner than recognize the Leonese governor. Then the king let him out, 
after making swear to remain subject to the kingdom of Leon and to give his daughter in marriage to Ordoño, the son of Ramiro. After this humiliation, Fernando González was less eager to fight beside the men of Leon against the Moors. He resolved to let the Leones take their share of humiliation, but this was not to be in the days of the great Ramiro, for he won another victory over the Muslims near Talavera in 950, and the next year he died in undiminished glory. On his death, Gonzalez began to play the part of kingmaker. He exposed the cause of Sancho against his brother, Ordoño III, and when Sancho succeeded the latter in 957, Gonzalez turned about and expelled the new king from Leon and set up a wretched cripple, Ordoño IV, surnamed the Wicked in his stead. Sancho took refuge with his grandmother Teuda, the queen of Navarre, and they presently appealed to the caliph of Cordoba to help them in their difficulties. Sancho was a martyr to corpulency. He could not even walk without being held up. He resolved to consult the eminent doctors of Cordoba, whose skill was famous all over the world. So Queen Teuda sent ambassadors to Abderrahman, who in return dispatched the great Jewish physician, Hasdai, to undertake the cure of Sancho the Fat. But he laid down certain conditions, among which was the surrender of a number of castles and the personal appearance of Sancho and the Queen Teuda at Cordova. It was a hard thing to make a long journey to the Moorish court, and to feel that she was there as a sort of show in witness to the caliph's power, but the queen went with her son, the king of Navarre, and her grandson, the exiled king of Leon. Abdel Rahman received them with all the gorgeous ceremony and all the native courtesy which belonged to him, and not only did Sancho speedily get rid of his fatness under the care of Hasday, but he returned to the north, supported by the armies of the caliph, who restored him to the throne of Leon in 960. In the following year, the great caliph died. He was seventy years old, and his reign, of nearly fifty, had brought about such a change in the condition of Spain as the wildest imagination could hardly conjure up. When he came to the throne, a youth of twenty-one, his inheritance was the prey to a thousand brigand chiefs or local adventurers. The provinces had set up their own rulers. The many factions into which the population was divided had each and all defied the authority of the sultan, and anarchy and plunder devastated the land. On the south, the African dynasty of the Fatimites threatened to engulf Spain in their empire. On the north, the Christian princes seemed ready to descend upon their ancestral dominions and drive the Moors from the land. Out of this chaos and vision of imminent destruction, Abdel Rahman had evolved order and prosperity. Before half his reign was over, he had restored peace and good government throughout the length and breadth of the Muslim dominions. He had banished the authority of parties and established the absolute power of the sultan over all classes of his subjects. In the second half, he maintained the dignity and might of his state against outside force, held the African despot at a distance, planted a garrison at Ceuta to withstand their advance, and contended with them on equal terms on the sea. And in the north, he curbed the growing power of the Christians of Leon, Castile, and Navarre, and so convinced them of his superiority that they even came to him to settle their differences and restore them to their rights. He had rescued Andalusia both from herself and from subjection by the foreigner, and he had not only saved her from destruction, he had made her great and happy. Never was Cordoba so rich and prosperous as under his rule. Never was Andalusia so well cultivated, so teeming with the gift of nature, brought to perfection by the skill and industry of men. Never was the state so triumphant over disorder, or the power of law more widely felt and respected. Ambassadors came to pay him court from the Emperor of Constantinople, from the kings of France, 
of Germany, of Italy. His power, wisdom, and opulence were byword over Europe and Africa, and had even reached to the furthest limits of the Muslim empire in Asia. And this wonderful change had been wrought by one man with everything against him, the restoration of Andalusia from the hopeless depths of misery to the heights of power and prosperity had been effected by the intellect and will alone of the great caliph Abdel Rahman III. The Moorish historians describe this resolute man in colors that seem hardly consistent with his strong imperious policy. Nevertheless, they describe him faithfully as the mildest and most enlightened sovereign that ever ruled the country. His meekness, his generosity, his love of justice became proverbial. None of his ancestors ever surpassed him in courage in the field and zeal for religion. He was fond of science and the patron of the learned, with whom he loved to converse. Many anecdotes are told of his strict justice and impartiality. The Arab historians tell us that after his death, a paper was found in the caliph's own handwriting, in which he had carefully noted those days in his long reign which had been free from all sorrow. They numbered only fourteen. O oh, men of understanding, wonder and observe how small a portion of unclouded happiness the world can give, even to the most fortunate. End of chapter 7Chapter 8 of the Moors in Spain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S.S. Kim, Seoul, South Korea. The Moors in Spain by Stanley Lane Paul. Chapter 8 The City of the Caliph. Cordova says an old Arab writer is the bride of Andalusia. To her belong all the beauty and the ornaments that delight the eye or dazzle the sight. Her long line of sultans form her crown of glory. Her necklace is strung with the pearls which her poets have gathered from the ocean of language. Her dress is of the banners of learning, well knit together by her men of science and the masters of every art and industry are the hem of her garments. So did the oriental historian clothe the city he loved with the far-fetched imagery of the East. Cordova, under the rule of the great caliph, was indeed a capital to be proud of, and except perhaps Byzantium, no city of Europe could compare with her in the beauty of her buildings, the luxury and refinement of her life, and the learning and accomplishments of her inhabitants. When we remember that the sketch we are about to extract from the records of Arabian writers concerning the glories of Cordova relates to the 10th century, when our Saxon ancestors dwelt in wooden hovels and trod upon dirty straw, when our language was unformed, and such accomplishments as reading and writing were almost confined to a few monks, we can to some extent realize the extraordinary civilization of the Moors. And when it is further recollected that all Europe was then plunged in barbaric ignorance and savage manners, that only where the remnants of the Roman Empire were still able to maintain some trace of its ancient civilization, only in Constantinople and some parts of Italy were there any trace of refinement. The wonderful contrast afforded by the capital of Andalusia will be better appreciated. Another Arab writer says that Cordova is a fortified town, surrounded by massive and lofty stone walls, and has very fine streets. It was in times of old the residence of many infidel kings, whose palaces are still visible within the precinct of the walls. The inhabitants are famous for their courteous and polished manners, and their superior intelligence, their exquisite taste, and magnificence in their meals, dress, and horses. There thou wouldst see doctors shining with all sorts of learning, laws distinguished by their virtues and generosity, 
warriors renowned for their expeditions into the countries of the infidels, and officers experienced in all kinds of warfare. To Cordoba came from all parts of the world students eager to cultivate poetry, to study the sciences, or to be instructed in divinity or law, so that it became the meeting place of the eminent in all matters, the abode of the learned, and the place of resort for the studious. Its interior was always filled with the eminent and the noble of all countries. Its literary men and soldiers were continually vying with each other to gain renown, and its precincts never ceased to be the arena of the distinguished, the race course of readers, the halting place of the noble, and the repository of the true and virtuous. Cordoba was to Andalus what the head is to the body, or what the breast is to the lion. Oriental praise is apt to be somewhat high-flown, but Cordoba really deserved the praise that has been lavished upon it. In its present state, it is impossible to form any conception of the extent and beauty of the old Moorish capital in the days of the great caliph. Its narrow streets of whitewashed houses convey but a faint impression of its once magnificent extent. The palace, Alcazar, is in decay, and its ruins are used for the vile purpose of a prison. The bridge still spans the Guadalquivir, however, and the noble mosque of the first Omayyad is still the wonder and delight of the travelers. But in the time of Abdel Rahman III, or perhaps a little later, when a great minister added a new faubourg, it is at its best. Historians are divided as to its extent, but a length of at least ten miles seem to be the most probable dimension. The banks of the Guadalquivir were bright with marble houses, mosques, and gardens, in which the rarest flowers and trees of other countries were carefully cultivated, and the Arabs introduced their system of irrigation, which the Spaniard, both before and since, have never equaled. The first Omayyad sultan imported a date tree from Syria to remind him of his old home, and to it he dedicated a sad little poem to bewail his exile. It was planted in the garden which he had laid out in imitation of that of his grandfather Hisham at Damascus, where he had played as a child. He sent agents all over the world to bring him the rarest exotics, trees, plants, and seeds, and so skillful were the sultan's gardeners that this foreign importation was speedily naturalized and spread from the palace over all the land. The pomegranate was thus introduced by means of a specimen brought from Damascus. The water by which these numerous gardens were supplied was brought from the mountains, where vestige of hydraulic works may still be seen, by means of leaden pipes, through which it was conducted to numerous basins, some of gold or silver, others of inlaid brass, and to lakes, reservoirs, tanks, and fountain of Grecian marble. The historians tell us marvelous things about sultan's palaces, with their splendid gates, opening upon the gardens or the river, or again giving entrances to the great mosque, whither the sultan betook himself on Fridays, over a path covered from end to end with rich carpets. One of these palaces were called the Palace of Flowers, another the Palace of Lovers, a third the Palace of Contentment, and another the Palace of the Diadem, and so forth, while one retained the name of the old home of Omayyad, and was called Damascus. Its roofs rested upon marble columns, and its floors were inlaid with mosaics, and so beautiful was it that a poet sang, All palaces in the world are nothing when compared to Damascus, for not only has it gardens with the most delicious fruits and sweet-smelling flowers, beautiful prospect, and limpid running waters, clouds pregnant with aromatic dew, and lofty buildings, but its nights is always perfumed, for morning pours on it her grey amber, and night her black musk. Some of the gardens of Cordoba had tempting names, 
which seemed to invite one to repose beside the trickling waters and enjoy the sweet scent of the flowers and fruits. The gardens of Water Hill gives one a sense of lazy enjoyment, listening to the monotonous creaking of the hill that pumped up the water to the level of the garden beds, and the meadow of murmuring waters must have been an entrancing spot for the people of Cordoba in the hot weather. The quiet flow of the Guadalquivir was a constant delight to the inhabitants, for the eastern and the moors of Spain were easterns in everything but longitude, loves nothing better than a view of a rippling stream. It was spanned by a noble bridge of seventeen arches, which still testifies to the engineering power of the Arabs. The whole city was full of noble buildings, among which were counted more than 50,000 houses of the aristocracy and official classes. More than a 100,000 dwellings were common people, 700 mosques and 900 public baths. The last were an important feature in all Muslim towns, for among the Mohammedans, cleanliness is not next to godliness, but is an essential preparation for any acts of prayer or devotion. While the medieval Christians forbade washing as a heathen custom, and the monks and nuns boasted of their filthiness, insomuch that a lady saint recorded with pride the fact that up to the age of sixty she had never washed any part of her body except the tips of her fingers when she was going to take the mass, while dirt was the characteristic of Christian sanctity, the Muslims were careful in the most minute particulars of cleanliness, and dared not approach their God until their bodies were purified. When Spain had at last been restored to Christian rulers, Philip II, the husband of our English Queen Mary, ordered the destruction of all public baths on the ground that they were relics of infidelity. Among the great architectural beauties of Cordoba, the principal mosque held, and still holds, the first place. It was begun in 784 by the first Abdel Rahman, who spent 80,000 pieces of gold upon it, which he got from the spurs of the Goths. Hisham, his pious son, completed it in 793, with the proceed of the sacking of Narbonne. Each succeeding sultan added some new beauty to the building, which is one of the finest examples of early Saracenic art in the world. One put the gold on the columns and walls. Another added a new minaret. Another built a fresh arcade to hold the swelling congregations. Nineteen is the number of the arcades from east to west and thirty-one from north to south. Twenty-one doors encrusted with shining brass admitted the worshippers. One thousand two hundred ninety-three columns support the roof, and sanctuary was paved with silver and inlaid with rich mosaics, and its clustered columns were carved and inlaid with gold and lapis lazuli. The pulpit was constructed of ivory and choice woods. In 36,000 separate panels, many of which were encrusted with precious stones and fastened with gold nails. Four fountains for washing before prayer, supplied with water from the mountains, ran night and day, and houses were built at the west side of the mosque, where poor travelers and homeless people were hospitably entertained. Hundreds of brass lanterns made out of Christian bells illumined the mosque at night, and a great wax paper weighing fifty pounds burnt night and day at the side of the preacher during the month of fasting. Three hundred attendants burnt sweet-smelling ambergris and aloes wood in the censers, and prepared the scented oil which fed the ten thousand wicks of the lanterns. Much of the beauty of this mosque still remains. Travelers stand amazed among the forest of columns, which open out in apparently endless vistas on all sides. The porphyry, jasper, marbles are still in their places. The splendid glass mosaics, which artists from Byzantium came to make, still sparkle like jewels on the walls. The daring architecture of the sanctuary, 
with its fantastic crossed arches, is still as imposing as ever. The courtyard is still leafy with the orange trees that prolong the vistas of columns. As one stands before the loveliness of the great mosque, the thought goes back to the days of the glories of Cordova, the palmy days of great caliph, which never will return. Even more wonderful, though not more beautiful, was the city and palace of Ezara, which Abderrahman III built as a suburb to Cordova. One of his wives, whose name was Ezara, the fairest to whom he was devotedly attached, once begged him to build a city which should be called after her name. The great caliph, like most Mohammedan sovereigns, delighted in building, and he adopted the suggestion. He at once began to found a city at the foot of the mountain called the Hill of the Bride, over against Cordoba, and a few miles distant. Every year he spent a third of his revenues upon this building, and it went on all the twenty-five remaining years of his reign, and fifteen years of the reign of his son, who made many additions to it. Ten thousand workmen labored daily at the task, and six thousand blocks of stone were cut and polished every day for the construction of the houses of the new city. Some three thousand beasts of burden were daily used to carry the material to the spot, and four thousand columns were set up, many of which were present from the Emperor of Constantinople, or came from Rome, Carthage, Sfax, and other places besides the home marbles quarried at Tarragona and Almeria. There were 15,000 doors, coated with iron or polished brass. The whole of the caliphs at the new city had a roof and walls of marble and gold, and in it was a wonderful sculptured fountain, a present from the Greek emperor, who also sent the caliph a unique pearl. In the midst of the hall was a basin of quicksilver, at either side were eight doors set in ivory and ebony, and adorned with precious stones. When the sun shone through these doors, and the quicksilver lake was set quivering, the whole room was filled with flashes like lightning, and the courtiers could cover their dazzled eyes. The Arabian authors delight in telling of wonders of this city of the fairest, Medinat ez Zara, as it was called after the caliph's mistress. We might go to a great length were we only to enumerate all the beauties, natural as well as artificial, contained within the precinct of Ezara, writes one, the running streams, the limpid waters, the luxuriant gardens, the stately buildings for the household guards, the magnificent palaces for the high functionary of states, the throng of soldiers, pages and slaves of all nations and religions, sumptuously attired in robes of silk and brocade, moving to and fro through its broad streets, or a crowd of judges, theologians, and poets, walking with becoming gravity through the magnificent halls and ample courts of the palace. The number of male servants in the palace has been estimated at 13,750, to whom the daily allowance of flesh meat, exclusive of fowls and fish, was 13,000 pounds. The number of women of various kinds and classes comprising the harem of the caliph, or waiting upon them, is said to have amounted to 6,314. The Slav pages and eunuchs were 3,350, to whom 13,000 pounds of flesh meat were distributed daily, some receiving 10 pounds each and some less, according to their rank and station, exclusive of fowls, partridges and birds of other sorts, game and fish. The daily allowance of bread for the fish in the ponds of Ezara was 12,000 loaves, besides six measures of black pearls, which were every day macerated in the waters. These and other particulars may be found at full length in the histories of the times, and recorded by orators and poets who have exhausted the minds of eloquence in their description. All who saw it owned that nothing similar to it could be found in the territories of Islam. Travelers from distant land, men of all ranks and professions in life, following various religions, princes, ambassadors, merchants, 
pilgrims, theologians, and poets all agreed that they had never seen in the course of their travels anything that could be compared to it. Indeed, had this palace possessed nothing more than the terrace of the polished marbles overhanging the matchless gardens, with the golden hall and the circular pavilion, and the works of arts of every sort and description, had it nothing else to boast but the mastery workmanship of the structure, the boldness of the design, the beauty of the proportions, the elegance of the ornaments, hangings and decorations, whether of shining marble or glittering gold, the columns that seemed from their symmetry and smoothness as if they had been turned by lath, the paintings that resembled the choicest landscapes, the artificial lake so solidly constructed, the cistern perpetually filled with clear and limpid water, and the amazing fountains with figures of living beings, no imagination, however fertile, could have formed an idea of it. Praise be to God, Most High, for allowing His humble creatures to design and build such enchanting palaces as this, and who permitted them to inhabit them as a sort of recompense in this world, and in order that the faithful might be encouraged to follow the path of virtue by the reflection that, delightful as were these pleasures, they were still far below those reserved for the true believer in the celestial paradise. In the palace of Ezra, the caliphs received the queen of Navarre and Sancho, and gave audience to great persons of state. Here he said to welcome the ambassadors which the Greek emperor sent to his court at Cordova. Having appointed Saturday, the 11th of month of Rabi el Awal, of the year of 338, A.D. 949, and fixed upon the vaulted hall in his palace of Ezra as the place where he would receive their credentials, orders were issued to high functionaries of state and to the commanders of the forces to prepare for the ceremony. The hall was beautifully decorated, and a throne, glittering with gold and sparkling with gems, was raised in the midst. On either hand of the throne stood the caliph's sons. Next to them was the viziers, each in his post to the right and left. Then came the chamberlains, the sons of viziers, the freedmen of the caliph, and the officers of the household. The court of the palace was strewn with the richest carpets and most costly rugs, and silk awnings of the most gorgeous kind were thrown over the doors and arches. Presently, the ambassadors entered the hall and were struck with astonishment and awe at the magnificence displayed before them and the power of the sultan before whom they stood. Then they advanced a few steps and presented the letter of their master, Constantine, son of Leo, lord of Constantinople, written in Greek upon blue paper in golden characters. Abdel Rahman had ordered the most eloquent orator of the court to make a suitable speech upon the occasion, but hardly had he begun to speak when the splendor of the scene and the solemn silence of great ones there assembled so overawed him that his tongue clove to the roof of his mouth and he fell senseless on the floor. A second essayed to fill his place, but he had not got very far in his address when he too suddenly broke down. So interested was the great caliph in building his new palace that he omitted to go to the mosque for three successive Fridays, and when at last he made his appearance, the preacher threatened him with the pains of hell for his negligence. Beautiful as was the palaces and gardens of Cordoba, her claims to admiration in higher matters were no less strong. The mind was as lovely as the body. Her professors and teachers made her the center of European culture. Students would come from all parts of Europe to study under her famous doctors, and even the nun, Roswitha, far away in a Saxon convent of Gaudersheim, when she told of the martyrdom of St. Eulogius, could not refrain from singing the praises of Cordova, the brightest splendor of the world. Every branch of science was seriously studied there, 
and medicine received more and greater additions by the discoveries of the doctors and surgeons of Andalusia than it had gained during all the centuries that had elapsed since the days of Galen. Albuquerque's or Abul Qasim Khalaf, to give him his proper name, was a notable surgeon of the 11th century, and some of his operations coincided with the present practice. Avenzo, even so, a little later made numerous important medical and surgical discoveries. Even Beitar, the botanist, traveled all over the East to find the medicinal herbs on which he wrote an exhaustive treatise. And Averroes, the philosopher, formed the chief link in the chain which connects the philosophy of ancient Greece with that of medieval Europe. Astronomy, geography, chemistry, natural history, all were studied with the other at Cordoba. And as for the graces of literature, there never was a time in Europe when poetry became so much the speech of everybody, when people of all ranks composed those Arabic verses which perhaps suggested the models for the ballads and canzonets of the Spanish minstrel and troubadours of Provence and Italy. No speech or address was complete without some scrap of verse, improvised on the spur of the moment by the speaker, or quoted by memory from some famous poets. The whole Muslim world seemed given over to the muses. Caliphs and boatmen turned verses, and sang of the loveliness of the cities of Andalusia, the murmur of her rivers, the beautiful nights beneath the tranquil stars, and the delights of love and wine of jovial company and stolen meetings with the lady whose curving eyebrows had bewitched the singer in the arts andalusia was preeminent such buildings as the city of the fairest or the mosque of cordoba could not have been erected unless her workmen had been highly skilled in their handicrafts silk weaving was among the most cherished arts of Andalusia, it is said that there was no less than 130,000 weavers in Cordoba alone. But Almeria had the greatest name for her silks and carpets. Pottery was carried to great perfection, and it was from the island of Majorca, where the potters had attained to the art of producing a ware shining with iridescent gold or copper luster that the Italian pottery obtains its name of Majolica. Glass vessels, as well as others of brass and iron, were made at Almeria, and there are some beautiful specimens of delicate ivory carvings still in existence, which bear the name of the great officers of the courts of Cordoba. These arts were no doubt imported from the East, but the Moorish workmen became apt pupil of their Byzantine, Persian and Egyptian masters. In jewelry, an interesting relic of the son of the great caliph is preserved on the high altar of the cathedral of Gerona. It is a casket plated with silver gilt and adorned with pearls, bearing an Arabic inscription invoking blessings upon the prince of the faithful, Hakam the second, which reads rather curiously upon a Christian altar. The third hills and jewels of the Moors were very elaborate, as the sword of Boabdil, the last king of Granada, shows. The Saracens were always renowned for their metal work, and even such small things as keys were beautifully ornamented. How exquisitely the Spanish Moors could chase bronze is proved by the engraving in chapter 11 of the beautiful mosque lamp, which was made for Mohammed III of Granada, and is still to be seen at Madrid. The delicacy of the open filigree work is only surfaced by similar work made at Damascus and Cairo. Over and over again, we read the same Arabic inscription, the motto of the kings of Granada, There is no conqueror but God. We have already spoken of the brass doors of the palaces of Cordoba, and some remains of these are still to be seen in the Spanish cathedrals. Everyone has heard of the Toledo sword blades, and though the tempering of steel is older in Spain, 
than the invasion of the Arabs, the skill of the Toledo armorers was fostered by the caliphs and sultans of Cordoba. Almeria, Seville, Murcia, and Granada was also famous places for armor and weapons. The will of Don Pedro in the 14th century runs, I also endow my son with my Castilian sword, which I had made at Seville, ornamented with stones and gold. In arts, sciences, and civilization generally, the Moorish city of Cordoba was indeed the brightest splendor of the world. End of chapter 8